everyone and thank you for tuning in. My name is Esme and I'm a producer at How To Academy and tonight we're joined by Dr Mark Harper. So Mark is a consultant anaesthetist in hospitals in both the UK and in Norway where he's calling from this evening. He's a leading expert in the prevention of hypothermia which is what led him to study the therapeutic uses of cold water swimming. The benefits of a cold swim are becoming more and more well known. I know lots of people who enjoy them but Mark is joining us this evening to explain the real science behind the magic of a chili dip. He's going to deliver the long-awaited evidence that cold water swimming can provide real health benefits and explore the eye-opening discoveries regarding the connection between swimming and everyday vitality. Mark's going to present for around 45 minutes and then I'm going to come back on screen to answer all your questions so please share any thoughts and queries in the Q&A box, and I'm going to try and get through as many as possible. So a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Mark Harper. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay, so I will now. So my title of my talk is How to Cold Water Swimming, but in the process, or to get to how to cold water swimming, I'm going to talk about why to cold water swim, and how to become a cold water swimming researcher. Now, that kind of sounds like this was a directed and premeditated course that I've taken. And of course, actually, it's just a series of coincidences that have brought me to this point, particularly at this time when the popularity of cold water swimming is just going through the roof. So, in broad terms, the reason I ended up researching cold water swimming is because of three loves of mine. One is skiing, one is swimming, though it didn't used to be cold water swimming, and one is real L and real pubs. So I'll explain the uh, other two pictures a bit later on. But first of all, the, uh, the skiing thing. So when I was training, you know, I finished medical school, uh, started training as an anaesthetist, and a couple of years in, I decided I would take six months off and go and work in a ski resort. Nothing medical, just as a, as a ski guide. Um, when I came back through another series of coincidences, I ended up organizing a, an annual conference. It's still running to this day. And uh, what I wanted to do, well, I thought, well, what can I, what can I talk about that first year? And I thought, well, cold that's kind of related to skiing and so I thought well I'll do a do a do a lecture about cold and the thing about cold so, so the thing about cold so becoming hypothermic is always bad for you and it's definitely bad when you have an operation and when you have an operation or rather the anesthetic you have a greater tendency to get cold and and, and this is true when you're swimming as well so it's fine to expose yourself to the cold water, but when you become hypothermic, that's, that's actually bad for you. So you, you don't want to stay in too long. Anyway, so what you get with surgery is a stress response. Now, these days, you've got uh, clever drugs and maybe a clever anaesthetist who stops you from being aware of this, but your body or your brain isn't aware of it but your body is still aware of it and you get this stress response and the stress response you get is actually higher than you would like. I mean, stress is a good thing in the right circumstance. I mean, it, it, to an extent, it depends how you frame it. Stress is excitement, but also stress can be bad for you and too much stress goes beyond excitement to where things kind of break down. Now, so one of my jobs as an anaesthetist, or possibly my main job, is to reduce the levels of stress both in myself, the environment, and the patient. And the thing about cold is it magnifies this stress response. So uh, it magnifies, yeah, the, the, the effect of cold, if you become hypothermic, you, your, your stress response becomes greater, it spends more time in the pathological or bad zone and less time in the good uh, physiological zone so what you can do what um so how does this come about and this tells us why cold water adaptation might help with this and of course actually to come back to that, cold water or uh, uh, becoming cold magnifies this stress response even more anyway so 
what's behind this? What's behind this is the autonomic nervous system. This, like everything, is a dynamic equilibrium. The body is set up with these equilibriums and the autonomic nervous system consists of the sympathetic part, which is the fight and flight, and the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest. And so to reduce the stress response, you can either reduce the sympathetic response, so less fight or flight, or increase the parasympathetic response, more rest and digest. Now, luckily, uh, cold water swimming does both of these. So getting into cold water is a stress and it sets off a stress response, which is broadly similar to that you see with surgery. And now this makes sense because you're unlikely to have a separate cold stress response and a separate, uh, you know, the body's not going to create separate cold and separate surgical or, you know, attack uh, responses. But what you get with cold water swimming, if you swim regularly, and we can see these effects after only four, five, six dips in the water, you go from being these uh, Japanese pilgrims on their annual New Year's Day purification ceremony where there is just stress to being uh, in the lower picture which is one of the participants in one of our courses in North Devon and so over time you adapt to that stress so that initial response is much less and your baseline levels of stress go down as well so that's a, a long-term effect you also have an immediate short-term effect and this comes from what's known as the diving reflex so when you put your face into cold water, that actually stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. And this has a, a direct effect on, on the autonomic nervous system and reduces your levels of adrenaline, noradrenaline and other, other factors. Now, of course, if you want to use this response or this adaptation to work in other areas you have to have cross adaptation you know just because you adapt to cold if you only adapt to cold that's going to be no good if you want to adapt to general stress in life and fortunately this is the case it does happen and this is a study undertaken by mike tipton and his team in portsmouth now mike is the guru of cold water swimming he has written the literally written a book on uh, the physiology of hypothermia and I'll, I'll come back to him so he plays a part in this story i'll come back to him uh, a bit later now what they showed is that if you adapted to cold stress so they, they, they did an experiment where people were exercising in a hypoxic environment and they found that those who went through a cold adaptation improved their performance after the cold adaptation compared to those who didn't and so this got me thinking, you've got the same response to cold and to surgery. And if you adapt to cold, your stress response adapts in a way that would reduce complications following surgery. So I thought, well, maybe uh, if we adapt people to cold, then maybe we could reduce the stress response to surgery and thereby reduce complications. And this was the first paper I published on the, the issue. And uh, as you can see, it was published in Medical Hypotheses and it still remains a hypothesis. And, but I still believe it, it, it has something to do. I think more and more we're looking at prehabilitation before surgery. And I think uh, that it does have potential, but we haven't got there yet. But then, I, then things moved on a bit. So the main way in which stress is or no stress a cold adaptation is good for the body and good for health is its effect on inflammation it has other effects as well but uh, the inflammation is a really important effect and this is also the basis of much of the surgical stress response and much of the bad surgical stress response and again inflammation like stress can be a good thing it's our first line of defense against infection for example but what you want to be it's not burning up you want to be nice and toasty warm by the fire and this is where uh, and this is where 
kind of the next two pictures come in. The first is, that's a conversation I was having with an old friend of mine. I grew up in Brighton, uh, and I even used to lifeguard on the beach. I hardly ever swam in the sea, you know, it was just far too cold. But I've always swam, you know, that's, that's how I keep fit, is by swimming. Now, when I moved back to Brighton, I rejoined the swimming club, and I was complaining to Jasper, possibly in this very picture, that, yeah, oh God, it's a, uh, you yeah, know, the swimming pool shut in the summer. What am I do for my swimming? So, oh, I'll go and join the, enjoy the sea swimmers. I mean, I didn't even realize the club had a sea swimming section. And of course, I was as shocked as anyone else when I discovered they actually swam all year round. But anyway, I went and joined them a couple of days later. And, you know, with the intention being, I just swam with them for a couple of weeks and then the pool would reopen that be it. Nearly 20 years later, I'm still swimming with them. And, the other really interesting thing about this was as I came out, I thought first swim that first day, probably 20, 25 minutes. But as I was walking back up the beach, I thought, I was quite surprised. I thought, God, I just feel so good. You know, I, I really wasn't expecting that. I was just expecting to have a bit of exercise. And then the next thing, that's a, a picture of a, a pint of beer, as you might have gathered. So every so often, I like to stop on my way home from work. Yeah, you I know, stop at my favourite pub, have a, two pints of beer and read the paper and read the or read the book or something like that. And one day I was uh, cycling back, uh, yeah, I was cycling back, sitting in the pub. And I read this article in The Guardian. It didn't come from anything medical. It was a uh, article. And, what this showed, it was an article about how depression is linked to inflammation. And also that if you reduce inflammation, you can improve the symptoms of depression. And I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, you can reduce inflammation through cold water swimming. And even though I'm not depressed, when I come out of the cold water, I feel so good. So maybe you can do, maybe you could treat depression with cold water swimming and through another series of coincidences a few weeks later i ended up meeting mike tipton and i put this theory to him and he said no oh, that's interesting you know because yeah mike is a, a fantastic researcher he's done amazing amazing work yeah in a totally different lead to me i'm sort of the conference and he's the uh, women's euro 2022 winners in terms of research but I do have a unique uh, USP, really, which is my clinical background. And then a few weeks after that, after I've met him and put this theory to him, uh, he was rung by TV doc Chris Van Tulliken, who was looking to do a television program called The Doctor Who Gave Up Drugs. The, yeah, so he said to Mike, yeah, is there something that yeah, we could use cold water adaptation or cold water to treat? And he said, well, it's funny you should say that because I've just met this guy who has a theory about what you can do, which is depression. So a few weeks after this, we were in Mike's lab in Portsmouth, and that's Mike in the middle there without the hair, and that's to his, uh, his left, our right, as we're looking at it, is Sarah. Uh, with the stripy jumper. Now, Sarah, 24 years old, she's been on antidepressants for eight years. Uh, she had a young baby and she just didn't want her baby, you know, her daughter growing up, seeing her taking pills. So she volunteered you know, through an advert in the GP surgery. She volunteered to come down and be filmed going through the process of cold adaptation with us uh, at, at Portsmouth. So, yeah, I said to, I said to um, Chris at the time, I said, well, what if this doesn't work? My whole theory goes out of the window. I said, don't worry, on TV it always works. Anyway, uh, it did work. And, you know, she, within about six months, she was off her antidepressants. And I had last had contact with her a, a few weeks ago, probably earlier in the year. And she's still off them. She's still swimming. And so she used cold water swimming to, to get off her antidepressants. And it, it's continued to work. But of course, as I say, it, it, well, as Chris said, it always works on TV. What we then needed to do was go out and see what happens in real life. So what we did was uh, a couple of years ago, uh, COVID notwithstanding, we managed to just about work our way around it. We uh, ran a study in North Devon. And a guy, Mike Morris, uh, 
has done a fantastic job at setting up these courses and between us so i've provided the scientific side of things and he's provided the actual on the ground day-to-day -day running of it and it, the courses are brilliant i've been down and joined in for one of them it's just a fantastic thing he's got going there and so we eventually have 59 patients with moderate uh, mild to moderate clinical anxiety and or depression do a a short so a six eight week course and they just uh, getting in the sea yeah you know, it's not about swimming for a long time or swimming miles and miles it's not about going in in ice baths it was just going out having some fun jumping around playing laughing in the water yeah as i say the the emphasis on confidence community safety and fun yeah swimming doesn't really even come into it and amazing well amazingly fortunately my theory still held up and we found that after after the course scores of depression you know the vast majority you found their uh, depression scores their anxiety scores were better you know all the scores are better and and what was particularly good and this is was that three months later they were still improved and this was where my theory came you know just like i carried on swimming after just two weeks of doing it my theory was that people would continue to do this because they just enjoy it so much and so this is what we found with the group as well as that they created their own whatsapp groups and started going on swims or getting other people getting other friends to join them and so even three months later uh, most of them were still swimming regularly and that's without any further input from chill which is a group mike set up to administer the courses